Hello and welcome to Making It, the podcast about making theatre and making it as an artist. I'm your host, Temi Wilkie, and each week I'll be chatting to an emerging playwright, theatre maker or theatre company about how they make theatre, why they make theatre and what they do to survive. I am so excited to be interviewing Jasmine Lee Jones this morning. In fact, excited doesn't even begin to cover it. At just 20 years old, Jasmine's debut play, Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner, opened at the Royal Court Upstairs this year. It promptly sold out, and if you missed it when it was on, it sucks to be you. It follows the story of best friends Cleo and Cara as they argue about their relationship and their politics on and offline. It explores race, cultural appropriation, beauty, call-out culture, and so much more. Everyone I spoke to about it was moved, stirred up and inspired by it. And I am in genuine awe of Jasmine's talent as a playwright. The playfulness and her use of form, the bravery of her subject matter and the clarity of her voice. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. Um, I could talk about Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner all day long. But um, as I said to you earlier, this podcast is basically about like how you got into writing and your process and sort of how you find things. So in, in the sort of practical sense. So question I'm going to lead with is how did you get into theatre? I wrote my first short play for a call out that the Royal Court did, the Open Court, which is how I came into contact with them. Mm. And it was like, it's funny because I wanted to write something else. And then this thing just came very quickly mm. and it felt sort of different from anything I'd written theatre wise before it was just coming out. Um, how long was it? It was, oh no, it was probably like four pages. It was so oh, wow. short. Yeah. And it was... I think I'm just thinking of the um, Miles Davis um, quote where he's like, it takes you so long to sound like yourself. And I'm Mm. still working out how to sound like myself because that was definitely like uh, copying, not copying, well, it it, it definitely, I was definitely like, oh, I have to write like this. I have to write like Mm. people I really admire um because that's writing and that's what sounds good and people are gonna think Mm -hmm. it's good but it still felt honest in a way that it didn't and something I really wanted to explore so I sent that in and it just felt I remember it just felt different to in in terms of anything I'd written it just felt like it was something I really was trying to work out and that Um, was like did you feel like that was a direct result from having contact with Debbie Tucker Green yeah I do I do in retrospect, at the time I didn't realise it, mm. but like, um, uh, like now I'm like, oh, that like all of it connects, like just let it, just, just let it go. And I, th- I had this weird theory, which I need to spend some more time on, but I was, when my play was on, I loved these conversations. It was one of my favourite, and working with young people, it was one of my favourite things. Um, and just talking to people like talking to creatives of different ages but these were like two very established creatives and it's funny because we all do slightly different things we all focus on slightly different things who um they were just two people that came to see my play and one right. an actor and one is a also writer but a novelist right and we're just talking about they both were like the biggest notes we get are about structure like you can't structure Mm. I've heard that well it's weird because because I've been lucky enough to be in like a hub Mm. where where I haven't been told you can't do this just like oh think about this I've never really felt I've never felt ashamed that ashamed about structure but I I remember them saying it I was like I know in another building I might have felt like that and so Um, you mean like the royal court specifically was so like liberating maybe with structure yeah and how how like very like how how do you write how do you want to tell the story Mm. um and so that was was that open court that you did that short play for and then what happened after that point like because you sort of said that was like your first introduction to the building but like yeah where did it kind of go from there because it sounds like it it really nurtured your relationship to form yeah yeah it's so the it's weird because I went to drama school. It wasn't like I carried on. I didn't consistently write anything. Mm. Um, I did the group at Soho and then I did. And then I met, I just met some very good people along the way. 
So I'm just like thinking yeah, about timeline. Tracking. So you're 14 when you did the short play for the Rock. No, I was I was 17. I was 14 ah. when I discovered playwriting. Was right, like right, right. Cool. Is yeah. a job. But yeah. <laughs> and that. then so Debbie Tucker Green was maybe when you were like 17, 16. I was 16, yeah. 16, cool. Then 17, you write the short play. Yeah. And then um, what happened when you sent it into the Royal Court? What was their relationship um, to the short play? So the whole festival, it was amazing. Mm. Um, very chaotic, but amazing. <laughs> um for me as well because it was like learning on the on the job um but the whole festival was like young people produce right right and so, so they staged the short play yes cool but in the, it's funny because originally they weren't going to do that and then it ended up happening for all of us we all got like our plays staged 15 minute plays um my friend was working as one of the producers mm -hmm. in this festival and i wasn't um and i wasn't there but i remember him saying like your piece got read out mm. and uh and people liked it mm. but I, I and then I remember getting the call but you know when sometimes when you have the feeling so I had I had this feeling I was like even if this doesn't go anywhere like I feel mm. like I've I, I've actually understood something mm. and then I found out I was so it was I think 15 writers were picked um between the ages of 17 to 25 mm -hmm. so yeah I sent I sent that in and then, so I was in my last year of college and um, it it was like, it was, it, it was kind of like this and not that it was violent at all, but I didn't know what I was doing. So it was like a baptism by fire. Mm. And we got, um, like, we just did loads of really cool projects. We did a theatre concept album. Whoa. Wait, so how long did this run for? How long was the festival? It was on, so we were attached to the theatre for a year. Wow. All of us. 10, t I think it was 15. And then the festival was in summer and like mm -hmm. we took over the office. That So the concept album based on To Pimp a Butterfly, because why not? Was in, <laughs> Incredible. Was in the office. And I remember the piece I wrote for, not to disparage my own work, but I was like, okay this is not what i want but i've learned mm. um and and that's amazing to be attached to such an incredible building for so long at such a young age yeah that's and, so cool and i i didn't realize what it what it was to be but i always felt welcome i never felt mm. like i was i didn't belong there but one of my friends who doesn't work in theater she she came to see the play and she just said like and not not because of this isn't to do with the staff at all, but I guess the legacy around the building, she, she just felt, she was made to feel by another audience member uncomfortable. Oh no. And, and, and I think that's on the basis that some people, certain groups of people presume that certain spaces are their spaces. Yeah, yeah. And I, and then I remember in the run up to Seven Methods going on, People are like, and you know, just based on the title, not having read the play, this is <laughs> great because this is going to challenge the Royal Court audience. And I was like, what is that? Mm. I watch plays here and I just didn't. And, and now I'm like, well, in a way, at the time I was like, this is cool because I'm not, I don't, I, I don't have that relationship. Mm, to this because building. you were like attached to it from such a young age yeah. and it felt like home. Is yeah, that, exactly. That's amazing. I didn't have it for a long time. And then I went to watch a show downstairs and I just went for dinner with my friend and I got, um, and we were getting a drink at the bar and we were like, there was a lot of people, I'd never seen that many people down there and this many people of that demographic. And I don't know how, maybe mm. because I always watch shows upstairs, but these, there was a group of five white people who were older. I don't want to presume their class, but I could tell from what they're wearing and they just didn't see us and they walked right in front of us and mm. ordered. What? At the like, bar? Yeah. And I just Ooh. was like. I looked at my friend and I was like, did that actually happen? And then mm. like five minutes later, she looked at me and was like, yeah, they did push in front of us. Cause she, I wasn't saying anything. I just looked at her. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm, this is, this is what they mean. We're right. an audience. I'm invisible. Yeah. Like you don't see me, see me in the, in, in, and <laughs> God, I felt like, I don't, what's, what's the term? I felt like, um, like those people that presume like because I'm I wasn't used to being being treated like that in mm. that space and I actually went up to them because I, I, I said to my friend I can't I have to say something because mm. I just it just didn't feel right to just stand there 
and take it. And they were so apologetic. But they, mm. the thing that struck me is that they just didn't realize. They yeah. didn't see. And then I was like, oh, this is the these are the people that own this. But it would be one thing if they. I guess it would be kind of less worse if they were like, oh, we just don't want to cue. Mm. But it was the fact that they clearly didn't see. Didn't notice you at all. Yeah. That's interesting. And like the fact that you came to that space without that kind of sense of that elitism or sense of that kind of like who owns the space. Like before really engaging with it, you you know, were already a, a member of it in lots of ways. Yeah. And like, and then you, you went to drama school, right? Mm. So like, so you... It just like thinking about this timeline that mm. I'm like building up of you. So like um, you're 17 when you did the open yeah. court. And then did you go to drama school straight after school or college? Yeah, literally a couple of weeks after the wow. open court Wow, oh thing, my yeah. God. Yeah, and it really did affect my taste because suddenly, like I, I feel like, I don't know. And I think it, it was probably also a surprise for them. It was like, I just had such clashing tastes. Like, and I mm. didn't realise... I didn't realize what it would. I d- I didn't realize what classical meant, hmm. and that. But but interestingly, unintentionally, as as are a lot of things, not understanding what it meant and really hating hating the narrow definition of what classical could be and what could be in the canon has hmm. really influenced my work. Yeah, as a writer, and in, yeah, and inspired mm-hmm. my work because I was just like, I, I think a lot of rage built up in me. <laughs> during those three years for for multiple reasons mm. but i um that that but then also finding myself you know it's so difficult because good writing is good writing no matter who it comes from so mm. i'm so inspired like and i still read some of the poetry we did there's some shit i'm just like i'm never touching that again <laughs> i think um but like some of some of it is just I was about to say universal. Some of it is universal, but I was just, when I'd disagree with my teachers and they'd be like, this is universal, this transcends anything. I'd be Mm. like, why are the things, and invariably some of them are, but why are the things that are, all the things we study are universal written by white people Mm. and always men? Mm. Well, actually they're always white and 90% of the time they're men. Mm. Like, and I'm sorry, but some of this isn't universal. Some of this is in incredibly exclusionary mm. um and so were you writing while you're at drama school like were mm. you feeling this way about like the ways that people spoke about the canon and what was universal but like kind of writing up a storm like outside of your classes or whether um, was there no time because drama is so drama school was so intense i guess both i didn't i guess i think i was writing internally mm. and then i wrote this what do you mean by writing internally what do i mean uh i think you're I think every human's always writing internally, but I think if you decide to write it down and you are a writer, then eventually it will get down in some way. But I think everything was shaping in my head, Mm. like all the feelings and it's weird. I I guess it's sort of like a, um, the image that comes to mind is like condensation, like Mm. something, it rains, or storms or whatever and then you get this heat which is kind of like the rage and then mm. god i can't remember i'm gonna have to go back to primary school but like, <laughs> um the rage and then like uh it sort of hits a cold surface and then it yeah cold surface and then it condenses and the con- mm. condensation is like the um when when the idea comes and i remember what i what i do remember is we we get to do this thing at Guildhall called a solo if you choose to do it which is how chewing gum chewing gum came out of that and loads Fiber of people have, of yeah and loads of people have made have ended up making professional shows um and I remember I was in first and I was just I had all this stuff in my head and I'd written this poem about I, I just became fascinated with why certain thing certain things were considered curriculum mm. um and like hip hop wasn't but having mm. an understanding of and and then I wrote this poem about it and 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 it inspired work but I remember having this light bulb moment that inspired this solo that I wrote um and was this, this in your third year the solo yeah show? yeah called curious and I'd watched 
I'd watched this film and I and I was just thinking about, and I think this is what I mean by writing in Italian. I was just thinking mm. about um, what it is and thinking about like why there were no, I'm like, so apparently there were pe- black people and people of color in the times of studying, but there's mm. just no real, unless like you believe that, the only one I could think of is with without rummaging. And I did eventually si- find some stuff, but the only one I could think of was um, uh, like the dark lady. Some people think she's African. A right. lot of people don't. Most people think she's Italian. And that's the dark lady of like Shakespeare's Yeah, sonnets. the sonnet. And that was kind of the only figure yeah. like that you would ever come across. Exactly. And that's not even someone who's a writer. That's somebody exactly. who like, is written about. Exactly. Maybe. Maybe. And <laughs> not from her perspective. And then like if you watch Amelia, you like loads of things went off in my head. I was like, I wonder what actually went on. Because mm. it's it. And really the nature of historical erasure. And I remember I was like, um, boom boom, oh, I need to write about this. And I didn't end up writing about it for two years. I need to research this. I need to find out about about this. Um, And so is that what Curious became? Yeah, Mm -hmm. it became about... uh, It became about me finding another woman and, 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 uh, and finding someone to look to and then in and then in third year going on a historical goose chase Mm. and but I knew that I think that's what I mean by writing internally when you realize what it is you need to touch on right right. um I loved it when you said that you feel like all humans do it I think there's something so like beautiful and elemental about that like Mm. that if you're thinking and sculpting your thought and developing a thought over a period of time then that is like right yes almost and I I just think everyone's an artist but it's whether Mm. you do it and whether you get the opportunity to do Mm. it so I think yeah no I was just gonna say um so you wrote Curious Mm -hmm. and was that a full-length play was that your first full-length play no it was if I wrote it the same year as Seven Methods so this is this was probably 15 minutes it's the next thing I wrote after Say Her Name that was like a play some Mm -hmm. people think it's a poem um but I knew I I had the idea for that before. It's interesting how things get structured, but I had the idea for that before I had the idea for um, Seven Methods. Seven Methods came about as, so I'd done Soho and I hadn't submitted a play because I was too busy. And then I met, I met. So so you did the Soho Writers Lab and yeah. the culmination of that is to give in a play. Yeah, and I didn't have okay. in a play. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah. I was going downhill. That must be good um, for like maybe listeners who might be feeling the strain if they're doing it. Oh yeah, it's it is it's yeah, but yeah, yeah. I didn't hand in my play, mm. um, and but it, I I also I'm now like oh that's not the play that you needed to write otherwise, right. um, you would have like you. I feel like no matter I don't know I don't want to say that because writing is really hard. Mm. But whatever the circumstances, if you need to get something. If you really need to say something, it yeah, will come out. Yeah. It might be messy, but um it just wasn't. And then when did I have the I don't I don't remember. But then that year I also met uh Jane Fallowfield, who now works at the court, who's amazing. Mm. And she she's was the literary at, manager yes, at the World Court. And uh she's working at Tallow and I was meant to do Tallow first and I couldn't do that either because because I was too busy with school. But um, she put me on another course, the London Writers Course at the BBC. And then mm-hmm. at the same time I was doing, that summer is when Seven Methods, the genesis of it came about. So I did this course led by Rachel Delahaye at the Royal Court mm-hmm. um, called The Andrew Project. And again, I wasn't meant to do it because mm. I'd already, I nearly didn't apply because I was like, oh, I've already done a course there. That's taking up too much space which is ridiculous wow, yeah that's so interesting that you thought that because i'm i know so many people who would net that that thought would never cross their minds i know minds. i know and it's really bad and i still have it mm. i still have like i'm taking even as technically well what is i'm always like 
when you're freelance, are you only employed when you're <laughs> actually doing the thing? Yeah. Because I keep saying I'm unemployed, which technically I am, but mm. but like even now I'm like, do I have the right to take this opportunity? Mm, mm. Even though I'm like, <laughs> it, it's really weird. But I thought that, and then I remember them saying to me, uh, "We really want you to do it, but if someone else comes along who hasn't done a course." Mm. well with us then we'll give it to them and I was like yeah sure I wasn't even going to re- apply and then they still managed to find a spot for me mm. um and it was a really great group I've never done the introductory course there and mm. that uh, the other reason why I didn't do the introductory course is the same reason I was like I'm taking up too much wow. sp- like that's, space. that's such that's so funny because I don't think anyone anyone would have felt that way because I, I know speaking of somebody who did the un- introductory course at the Royal Court like it's not about it's a Everyone needs resources. Everyone needs exactly. help on, and support on their journey. I just, yeah, I... One thing that I'm super interested in, yeah. like, with what you're saying is that, like, you are at drama school. Like, drama school is no joke. Like, you're yeah. working so many hours, like, with your body. Like, it's so physical. And then you're w- writing, like, coming up with these ideas, doing these courses. And, you know, with Soho, you didn't manage to, like, complete... Mm. You didn't write the play. Mm-hmm. And then, like, sort of with Tala as well, like just what the relationship between your acting and your writing is like um yeah speaking of somebody who's an actor who yeah. thinks of themselves as an actor first the relationship oh, do you? As yeah first. Wow. like what your relationship with that like it i think i see them as two different spheres i'm still working mm. out because yes yeah. what i do remember is like and it's not because i'm Lawrence olivier or Meryl Streep or whatever but I just remember getting so bored hmm. at drama school I think it was second it happens it happens for a lot of people in second mm. year actually or you just experience something but I just remember getting so bored and being like I don't want to I remember we we're doing mask which is actually really interesting but I was like I'm more interested in at this point in watching and then I remember like mm. talking to this guy and being like outside of school and just being like I want to leave and be a playwright I mm. want to write and I hadn't written I hadn't written another play, so it's just bizarre. And then a year later, the pl- play got programmed. Wow. So it's just, that's, I you don't sort know, of put I that into the universe. It. Like you said, you said, I want to be a playwright and yeah, that's, that's the, I, yeah, yeah. And I had no idea it would happen, but at that point, I was like, I think I just want to leave. And I didn't leave, and I'm glad I stayed. But in terms of the general relationship, I think. What is it? I don't write. I know that there are some writers that write to put themselves in stuff. I'm not mm. like that. I write. And I remember when the play was on or right before people were like to me, do you have to be in it? Or mm. are you going to be in it? And it just never felt right. And then mm. I was like, am I making the right decision? Because I'm not like, I, I'm i just starting out as an actor. Mm. Not even the right decision, but it just never felt right. And I wasn't, I didn't need to be doing either mm. of those roles. I'm very like that. I think. I think sometimes, I don't know, maybe... You feel like you can be more objective as a writer. Oh, and definitely. like you want to serve There's, the play. Like I, you want you want the play to be the best it can be. Exactly. So putting yourself in it sometimes feels like I would have two hats on and be feeling exposed in two different right. ways. Whereas like the best way to make this play the best it can be is I had the same thing with the high table that's coming up. Like I yes, was, people are like, so. You're gonna be in it. And it's like, no, I, no. Need, I, need, I need to see it. I need to yeah. d- sculpt it from outside. Exactly. And and why I don't I think I don't know if you're similar to me in this but I don't create material for myself Mm. but I also have performed in my own work as like a I did curious and then with that I'm like literally because I put myself in it Mm. with that I'm like uh could anyone else do this not because there isn't anyone capable of it but like just my ridiculousness (laughs) and the fact that the the character the character one of the characters, there's a historical woman and then there's me. Mm. One of the characters is called Jazz, the mm. other character. So, yeah. like... Um, it's how... sort of like thinking about the longevity of the piece. Like, can yeah. it? Can somebody else, like, would someone else have the opportunity to do this? I really want to come back to um, how uh, Seven Methods got programmed. Yes. But one thing I want to ask before mm. we get onto that is, like, you know, it sounds like you're doing lots of writing around your like acting degree, mm. but I'm interested in like your process. Like, yes, how do you write? Like, do you write on paper? Do you write on a laptop? How do you go about it? Both. I mean, mainly the laptop. I'm, I am I have to write something very soon. I have a week to do it. Mm. And I'm really like, I, so it's interesting because I write 
even if I'm not writing for work, I try and write every day. Mm. Um, so I do morning pages. I mm -hmm. do three day and that it's really just as a mental health thing. I started doing it last year when I was having some trouble and it's, it's really good. And I think it slows down my thought processing mm -hmm. because we're like the internet has really affected. Mm -hmm. um, Can you talk us through what morning pages is? It's a book about releasing your creativity. Mm. Um, and you write through a day, you have to, first thing, you can't look at your phone. Mm. Sometimes I do cheat. I do hmm. look at my phone and I'm like, okay, now. Um, and it's that first thing in the morning, like the first yeah, thing you do. Yeah, because your brain just does something You and you can write anything though. Mm. It's not about, and it has to be, the rule is write anything. Mm. It has to be unfiltered and it just releases your brain. But that, and a lot of people just start, I and I use it as like a mental health tool as well. Mm. But a lot of writings come out of it. And so okay. do you, is that on paper? Like morning pages is very much like on pen paper, to paper. And I find it really good, useful for me because it just slows down my processing in the way I think. And it helps me understand things. And there was a time where I was doing it really consistently, like last summer. And I never write. I'm, I think as a writer, as a writer, writer, I'm very patchy so I write things out of order I'm like oh this sentence feels right I write a lot mm. in the notes on my phone uh seven methods for everything I've written is always out of order and then mm. I reorder it I don't write so is it is way. the process that you kind of like might write in patches on paper or on your phone and then yes. bring it together on the yeah laptop? yeah yeah that's yeah, I see yeah, yeah that's basically and that's also influenced by the thing Debbie said about structure like mm. it it's sort of like that and I can't it's um just so people listening sorry. like uh, Jasmine's kind of like moving her hands like yeah. around in circles if that makes sense yeah sorry for that noise <laughs> strange noise rubbing um but it like it's not yeah it's like a jigsaw puzzle mm, I think yeah. for me um and what does like a working day look like if if you are just focusing on writing I'm still trying to work it out I think because I only really had because when, no, no, in fact, I can say it now, the play's gone on. <laughs> but um, when Seven Methods was programmed, it was the original draft, which was the thing in uh, the, 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 it wasn't a commission uh, because it wasn't paid, but the mm. group, the, I, the idea that, um, well, the idea was we'd all write 15 minute plays. So when mm. it was programmed, it was still 15 minutes. Oh, wow. And it was at one point it was going to go on as three, like we were going to do three shows a day. And then we decided not to because just in case I wrote, just in case I wrote more. Right. And at that point I was like, oh, um, oh, let's just turn this into a full length play. <laughs> not knowing what I was getting to myself. Into. <laughs> and maybe if I knew I would have been like, no, but because because of that and because I was still at school I, I'm still and so I've never done really I've never done like I'm a full-time writer really so mm. I'd write on weekends or like after school mm -hmm. or in the early hours of the morning it ended up becoming mm. and then go to school so I don't I don't know what a day is like there were like when I was on break so I'd what what does it look like? I'm, I'm still very... <laughs> hey, the answer is you don't know. Do, yeah. And that is really valid and, and helpful. I think I'm quite a bit of a mess and I really yeah. want to be <laughs> well, no. more disciplined, but I kind of just start when but I it start. It sounds like you're incredibly disciplined. Like you do morning pages every day. Like, and I feel like the, like, it sounds like the answer is you don't have a normal working day mm. yet. Yeah. And that is such a big part of it. Like, um, I feel like especially at the stage that we're at in our careers, that is such a valid answer and, and really helpful. Yeah. So like, don't feel pressured to answer it if it's like, th there is sort of no answer to that yeah. one. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of like, I start when I start and I finish when I yeah. finish, which yeah. is not like, I need, I also need to stop that if I'm going to try and write, carry on writing, I think, because it's mm. not necessarily <laughs> Can't be sustainable. sustainable. Mm. But in the early hours, hours in the morning, it feels like time's sort of limitless mm. and I don't need to worry. So I did when a lot of When you say early writing. hours in the morning, what time? Like what time? 3 a.m., 4 wow. a.m., 5 a.m. I really need to stop doing it. But <laughs> I, I, I mean, it sort of came out of a necessity because I was at school. I just had to do it like that. Wow. Um, so, but I... Time feels limitless. That's really yeah, 
it does because it just feels like it's not invariably because then I'd wake up the next day and be like, why did you do that? But mm. it just feels like it goes on into infinity. And that's really helpful for me because mm. as soon as I feel any restrictions, like I'm, I get really scared of when you get like, and I'd, I'd love to do them. But when you're, when people are like write a play about this and da, 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 you have this, this and that, <laughs> I'm like, because it just feels. That's so interesting, especially with what you're saying about structure as well, that like any kind of limit feels like it impinges on your creativity oh yeah but like and so time or um or a, a way of writing like feels like you can't really be creative yeah it's it's I think it scares me mm. um I'm really interested in um you sort of started talking about it but the process mm. of of seven methods becoming programmed like what how did that happen the answer is it nearly it's not that it nearly didn't get programmed it nearly didn't get written because mm. I remember so I was at school I just done so I said this thing about I want to leave and become a writer and the irony now is I'm like I need to do acting mm. like it, it it happens um <laughs> but like I think it's just being like having two disciplines yeah. sometimes you favor one more than the other and it can um, swing back and forth oh absolutely mm. and I think I so so that happened and then by I had like a deadline in December and I kept moving it back because I was mm. at school and they very kindly let me move it back, I think twice, mm. which was to become a ru running theme in the <laughs> life of seven methods. Um, but I, I, um, but so you're saying that you had a deadline, how, um, there was a draft that they read and then they were interested in it and that's how the deadlines Well, this came is up. before it was even, there was even a question of oh, it being right, programmed. Okay, cool. So like that, that we all did there was this thing called the andrew project and we did oh, readings right. okay, so with rachel um yeah so it was to send in for that just a day okay. of readings um and i nearly didn't do it because i was like this is too much like mm. i have school doing stage combat and i remember some people saying just focus on school mm. um and i was just thank like, god you didn't well yeah i'm i'm lucky i i'm i'm lucky i didn't but something inside me was just like which is the worst and probably best part of me at times <laughs> it's just like no let me just do it mm. let me just try and do more than it one all. thing at once and then I end up tearing my hair out mm. um and so I d I remember I sent in a draft in the very out early hours of the morning in the middle of term and then I had another deadline I got notes and then I had another deadline in the v and I did it I literally sent it in at like 7 a.m and I've been <laughs> up since midnight so I did it in the middle of the night and it's interesting because they they have a theory about like it being like Cleo in the play like she does it in the early hours of the morning mm, so it's like yeah so I, I sent it in and I forgot about it I, I remember that night I went out I went to like three parties <laughs> which is what you do when you hit a deadline yeah and then I forgot about it and then I remember I was like um it was like a week away to actually having to watch it I was like oh my god I want to watch it mm. So as part of the Andrew project, it was yeah. staged. Cool. Yeah, like a stage reading. So all of us had a right. stage reading, but they were quite theatricalized. Mm. And we had, so yeah, so then I went and I, I was like, okay, I can go if I bring my notebook and write down everything I don't like, because I was really, like, I'm not going to like this. And then I was like, I'd never really s seen my work in an audience in that way. Mm. I'd done done it with say no, but this was different for some reason. And I could feel it bouncing off the audience and the bits that I wanted to change. And it was better than I thought it was, but I was still like, I really don't like this play. Um, <laughs> but then, so what was the process of it being going, programmed? Was being it like programmed? It was like, again, so I remember bumping into Chris who now runs a bunker and Vicky in the bar. So and Chris, Chris had watched it. And yeah. Chris Sonix. Um, and, uh, and, Vicky Featherstone, who's the artist director of the Oracle, and she hadn't watched it, but Chris was like, you should uh, read the play Jasmine wrote. Um, he later told me he told her, told her he thinks sh she should read this play. And I was like, and she was like, can I read it to me? And I said, mm. I, I almost said no. I was like, maybe, let me think about it. Because <laughs> How I just old were you at this point? Oh, I would have been 19. So the, <laughs> you're 19 years old and the artistic director of the Royal Court comes up to you, it's like, can I read your play? And you're like, shook. Yeah. Because I just didn't think it was good. I just mm. didn't like it. I just was like, this is just weird. Um, I just thought it was such a strange play. It still is a strange play. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I was just like, this is just weird. Um, and 
yeah, I was just sort of like, uh, and, and like there was there was more of that. So then that happened and then she must have got sent it and read it. And then two months later, I was doing Oklahoma. So this was two months later. At drama school. Yes. <laughs> and I remember being like, um, and and Hamish Piri phoned me and said, and said, do you want to write more? There's some ideas about it. And I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is very good. Um, and he was like, well, do you have any other ideas? And I was like, okay, yeah, I do have another idea. And he was like, just send me what, send me the idea. Um, so I sent it to him and they were like, and they liked the other idea. And then, um, I was like, and, and then, so yeah. And then it, Seven Methods got forgotten about. So at the time I had this old map and it broke and seven <laughs> methods was on there no yeah so i just lost the play it wasn't <gasps> backed up now everything i back up everything but Ugh. i also didn't really it's not that i didn't care i was annoyed but i was like what well, it's not like i i thought it's not like i thought it was my masterpiece or mm. anything it was just gone so i broke i spilt green tea on it stupid oh. and of course i couldn't afford i was at school so i could, just couldn't afford a new one i didn't have enough money for it mm. um and then, and the first thing I did when it got programmed is buy a new Mac so I can finally afford it. Yeah. Um, but so that happened. And then I went to see another play at the Royal Court. This must have been, it was the end of terms. So it must have been a month later. Um, and I just happened to be in the bar and it was a Saturday. And I remember, I remember being downstairs, like properly downstairs and you know, the stairs and there's like the table mm. and Vicky and Hamish were there. And my friend who produced this, Matthias, who who was one of those producers mm. in open court, was talking to them, and I, and I almost didn't go over mm. bizarrely because I was like, because obviously I know them, and I was like, let me just go over and say hi, and I went over and say said hi, mm. and we had like an impromptu meeting at mm. eleven o'clock, and they were like, do you want to again? They said, do you want to write more? And I was like, no, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. Can I just ask why you think you kept kind of saying no? Because I you know mm. you wanted to be a playwright you like you you know like I'm just intrigued as to what that where that where that no came from inside you I think because it felt quite raw it felt mm. <laughs> shamefully I think some of the like the what I, now interludes in the play like the spoken word interludes I was like oh no I I don't want to watch a play with spoken word mm. Lich, like it was it was as surface as that I was like no mm. I'm not but I feel like you're talking about the kind of artistic merits of it but I'm just wondering like if there's any imposter syndrome if there's any any of that stuff um, like I don't know I'm just a bit because it wasn't like I was like this isn't a play like I, <laughs> I haven't seen anything like this I want to be mm. a traditional playwright I want so it was kind of like that structure demon that like came back like yeah yeah this isn't what I'd want my debut to be or this isn't what and I remember there was a lot of I think being in this age as well where a lot of I didn't want to do something that was self-righteous mm. or with any and that was a big part of developing it I didn't want to do something that was just like white people are bad this is bad duh, 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 without mm. any ambiguity because I was just like that's not and I felt like the original was that in a way there was that ambiguity but it was just I, I just didn't want to do something where there was it was completely detached mm. from that um, and that's amazing that you say that because that was something I felt was so clear like the nuance and the depth of I'm glad what, like that show was like it was so varied and like kaleidoscopic almost in in the way that it expressed i'm like, so glad you thought that yeah what was the moment where like vicky said this is happening like then what? three months later it was wow was <laughs> a year ago today not a year ago today but a, August. less than a year ago it was september actually ah september 2018 no september 2018 yeah right. so less less than a year ago mm. um she I went into a meeting and I thought it was about the other idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I had like my scrapbook <laughs> and a plan and I was describing it to them and they were like, yeah, great. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, cool, but however. We're yes, <laughs> literally. Uh, do you want... Uh, and they commissioned this idea, this other idea. Mm. Um, uh, uh, what, like, 
how do you feel about Seven Methods? And I was like, R-? I just hadn't heard the name in so long. I mean, that's amazing that like you walk into that office and it's like, yeah, cool. We'll give you a commission for the idea you came in with. I Don't know. worry about it. But we want to look at yeah. like, the other idea that you had. What an incredible meeting. <laughs> I know. it was, And also it was a weird day because I bumped into loads of people in that building that sort of uh, um, were part of my genesis. Like mm. I bumped into... Who like I remember they ran late because there was another person having a meeting, Prasanna, who directed me in like the first show I did. Mm. Um, and then yeah, she just said it, and I was like, and then I couldn't, and I was like, okay, if I got to, and at that point I was like, could I change anything? And she's like, I don't think you need to, but mm. if if you want to, and it was still this twenty minute draft, and mm. then they were like, we we want to put it on. It might not, it 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 might take a while, but. Da, da, da. and so, when they sorry no yeah. i'm just like interested that like because you sort of saying they programmed it and they were happy for it to be 20 minutes long yeah and then eventually it became a full play yeah i'm one thing that i'm really interested in is like the rehearsal process yes. as well and the that was and the performance point. like what it was like to see it in performance can you talk a bit like briefly about that process, like how much you rewrote and then like what it was like in rehearsal yeah. and seeing it staged. So I'd say 90% of the play stayed the same from rehearsal mm. to performance. Um, but definitely like having Danielle Tia, uh, Millie, Sylvia, Ella, mm. all so, of the people. Um, Danielle and Tia were, were the actors, actors. Millie, Millie is the director. The director. Sylvia and Ella were on the stage management. Everyone that was in the room, oh God, like Raja, um, Elena, like uh, Jess, everyone on the creative team, everyone on the stage management team, everyone made it what it became. Mm. But it was a lot of, I think by going to drama school and having to say a lot of things I didn't want to say on stage, I was just like, I need, like, I need honesty. What's, how do you, and it doesn't mean we don't disagree, but what, how does this feel in your mouth? Like Mm. what? does this feel right? Why doesn't it feel right? And if it doesn't, so being an actor kind of informed you as a playwright in the rehearsal room. Cause it's I, like, I think tell so. me if this doesn't sound yeah. right. And it's not to say we d- didn't disagree at, mm. at points, but it, it was sort of that. And, um, so it was, it was really collaborative and really like anyone can speak. Um, and anyone can say, so it was just trying things and seeing them in the room and like making tweaks mm. based on how they'd say things. But not, yeah, 90% of the play was there, but, but because of the nature of it, cause it's just so, it's weird <laughs> and that's fine because of the nature of it, it. It was, there's only so much I could write without actually seeing it because there was like the Twitter, Twitter ludes as they ended up being called. Mm. And then when we were in tech, you know, I remember loads of the Twitter got lifted mm. because I re because then and then structure comes in mm. you, like mm. you just realize how much it can take and how much mm. the audience can take. And what was it like seeing it in front of an audience? How did that feel? What was that? Very very surreal. I remember having like nearly collapsing on press night because Whoa. it's so much when there's all that energy in the room and there's people that really want to support you and do support Mm. you and then there's also people there's critics and Mm. there's like there's that voice which is it 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 felt very spirit uh loud Mm. and not actually in the sense that people were making noise but very loud spiritually loud yeah wow um so that was very but press night's very specific i there were days where i hated watching it in front of people and there Mm. were days where i loved it and i the days I love the most is when people felt like I hate like rules felt like they could talk back to it or talk Mm. even in the middle of it. I'm sure. (laughs) But of course I'm not having to do it. So I don't know what that was like, but, Mm. but where you, when you get the sensation back. Yeah. That the audience are like giving energy to it as well. And, and are willing to come to it even like, Mm. so I did, I was part of an international residency at the Royal Court, I, not that I traveled, but I was working on it with writers they brought to the court and mm. a playwright I, I was partnering with, who's an amazing playwright called Leonie, who's from France. She, she read the play, like the thing that moved me so much is that obviously the play's so, it's not only, it's, she's not English. She, mm. she can she's read French. and speak English, mm. but, um, uh, 
it's it's not only English, but it's also slang. Mm. There's also just so it's a very specific way of speaking. And the thing that moved me so much was that she um she read the play beforehand and just like Googled all of the things she didn't understand. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like th- that that was a moment for me because I was like, I don't have to cater to it. Yeah, yeah, I can like if people want to come to it, they'll come. Mm. Um, even someone who's from a foreign, like a different country mm. and doesn't English isn't their first language. Um, so that that really moved me. That's um, like I just think it's really amazing the the shape of your journey, like sort of struggling with structure and feeling like restricted by it, mm. and then realizing that you can like release yourself from it because of like speaking to Debbie Tucker Green and then kind of, I don't know, having a bit of structure mm. that you uh, at times were into, but with drama school, but that feeling of like, this is how you should write, or this is what a writer looks like, or this is what the canon looks like. Mm. And then coming out the other side of it with um, Seven Methods, where it's like, no, I can write who I, what I want. I could be who I am in my writing and mm. people will come to it or they will like yeah. not come. Like yeah. that's really amazing. And Something I'm really interested in, like just like, as we sort of close the podcast, mm. because you've deeply inspired me, like that play. Oh, like, thank you. I've, you inspire me too. Oh. <laughs> but um, watching it, I just felt like there's so much that you could do with form. And I just felt so invigorated and inspired and like excited by what you had to say. But I'm wondering what inspires you and also what you're, what, what you're excited about writing next. Mm. <laughs> what inspires me? Everything. Mm. In, in short, that's not a great answer because it's not specific, but um, just existing, ev- literally everything. Mm. Like, I, I love, I love walking. <laughs> I was just, I was just away and I literally, I spent the whole eight days I was there just walking mm. um, um, and just watching and really watching. I think the thing that, and like bringing down when you bring down the wall that all of us have to wow sorry to varying degrees um i do think anything's possible mm. um and you can just see the world just sort of does this it kind of um, broadens yeah it totally does um and uh what was i going to say what am i excited about right next i just want to tell i just want to tell the stories of people like people i know and people that I think the thing that excites me about theatre is it's such a exciting form and the thing I think is really exciting is the fact that there are so many voices that aren't heard that are theatrically worthy Mm. um so I'm excited about doing that and that means groups that have been traditionally marginalized like how I'm just excited about bringing those people to the forefront and it might not always be in traditional theater spaces mm. but i think there's value in that too mm. um um I'm, I'm just yeah i'm excited about carrying on playing and hmm. invariably <laughs> there'll be times where uh i felt i hate the word failure but where where i struggle with it mm. definitely but i um I'm just, I'm just excited about that. Just excited. Those are so, such general answers. That's no, they're not. They're really beautiful. I like, love the idea that you're excited to fail, like to have the space to fail because yeah. lots of people aren't afforded that, especially if you are exactly. marginalized from a marginalized exactly. group. So that's amazing to feel like I'm excited to make work that might be shit, that I might fuck yeah. up, but that's beautiful. And also I feel so excited to see the work that you're going to create because putting marginalized people on stage is so important. Something that I felt when I watched Seven Methods is like, I'm seeing my sister on stage. Like I'm like, oh, my sister so talks glad. like that. I'm getting a bit emotional thinking about it. Like my sister talks like this. And I never see her on stage. And that is like such an amazing thing to be doing. So mm. I'm so excited to see what you do next. And I'm so pleased Likewise. that you're able to join me. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks so much for listening to Making It. If you'd like to hear more, make sure to subscribe and leave us a cheeky five-star review. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Way, and you can book to see my debut play, The High Table, which will be on at the Bush Theatre in Shepherd's Bush from February the 8th. Making It is produced by Jane Ryan, 
edited and scored by Kazra Farizia, photography by Jess Ravel, artwork by Theo Banner, and hosted by me, Temi Wilkie. The podcast is supported by the Bush Theatre and London Playwrights, and is a proud member of the One Fine Play Network.